Welcome to the Craftsman Online Podcast. This is a weekly program focused on the relevant topics in Freemasonry and the various aspects of the craft. Any opinions, thoughts, or viewpoints shared during this program are that of the individual and do not reflect the official position of any Grand Lodge, appendant, or concordant body from which that member may hail. I'm your host, Brother Michael Arce, Editor-in-Chief of CraftsmanOnline.com. Very excited about this episode because when the topic was first proposed, I looked at our guests and was like, what is Fringe Freemasonry? And that's the cue to welcome him back, Brother Angel Millar, who's also the uh, Editor-in-Chief, the Interim Editor-in-Chief of the Fraternal Review. Welcome back, Brother Angel. Thanks very much. It's good to be here. And I feel lucky because not only do we get you back on our podcast, but also a bit of a preview as the topic of fringe Freemasonry will soon be covered in the February edition of the Fraternal Review. So let's start at the 30,000 foot level. When you first suggested this episode, I, I think my response was probably in line with a lot of other brothers who are unfamiliar with this study. What is your definition of fringe Freemasonry? Yeah, so French Freemasonry really begins during the 18th century when uh, when the craft spreads uh, across Western Europe, especially through uh, France and Germany. And there you get all kinds of new uh, quote unquote Masonic orders and rites um, being created, uh, sort of rubbing up against each other, overlapping with each other, uh, competing with each other. And um, some of these are the strict observance, which claim to have a Templar origin, but again, um, claim to be Masonic. And uh, another order, uh, which we actually write about in the uh, fringe masonry uh, issue of Fraternal Review, is the um, uh, Asiatic Brethren, which again, Masonic, but focused on Kabbalah and on uh, interpreting and translating Kabbalistic texts. Um, the Kabbalah, of course, was originally a, a Jewish mystical theology and was incorporated into Christian thought a few centuries before uh, Freemasonry um, really um, to spread across Europe in the 18th century and later, of course, would uh, uh, impact the uh, Western uh, cult tradition. But uh, there were other orders as well, of course, such as the Egyptian rite of Freemasonry, which uh, many brothers probably would have heard of. Uh, again, although it claimed to have an Egyptian origin, uh, was again influenced by Kabbalah. Uh, many, many of these rites and orders uh, were influenced by Kabbalah. Uh, alchemy, hermeticism, and uh, Rosicrucianism, as well as uh, Christian um, Christian chivalry as well, and the idea of knights. And, um, you know, the, this at least uh, partly goes back to uh, Chevalier de Ramsey's um, oration to the Grand Lodge of France, uh, where he associated Freemasonry with uh, knighthood, and with Scotland, obviously Scotland had a long history of, uh, of masonry, but associated it specifically with uh, Scotland and uh, with knights, uh, the Crusaders. And, um, and from there you get, you get these sort of knightly orders. So of course, if you look at the Scottish right, you have various knightly degrees. If you look at the York right, of course, you have the Order of the Temple uh, in particular, as well as other knightly degrees. And uh, the word Scotland becomes important in uh, French Freemasonry. And of course, today we have the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite. And uh, that itself was really born in these sort of fringe Masonic uh, rites of, of, in France of, of the 18th century. But it, that has become, we might say, regular, whereas many of the other rites just uh, disappeared into history or, or, or may still be going in for some form, but really uh, are very, very small with a very few practitioners. What's interesting about this topic is that there's a lot of history in Freemasonry around the revolutionary era, I, I would say. That's when this was really starting to churn right. as the world was growing. Yeah. When you say fringe Freemasonry, you're not talking about what I thought of immediately, which would be things like the Odd Fellows or the Elks or Knights of Columbus that could loosely be associated with Freemasonry. Um, no. Nor are you talking about people that we would identify as like enemies of the craft. No, right. So, well, so, you know, today, of course, we have the uh, York Rite, the Scottish Rite. Uh, and various other orders, such as uh, the Knight Masons, um, uh, which, which are all 
part of uh, mainstream Freemasonry in America, for example. Um, but uh, during the 18th century, you get uh, you get these different uh, rights and orders being created, much like the Scottish Rite today or the York Rite. Um, and, so, and some of them are conferring the craft degrees, and some may not be. But uh, but they are claiming to be Masonic, and um, uh, but they have a different take on it. So the Asiatic Brethren, uh, they are focused on Kabbalah. Uh, and again, the, the, the strict observance claims to have a Templar origin, but again, but claim that it's a legitimately Masonic as well. So it's more, it's, it would be more similar to uh, New York or Scottish right in a sense. But while we recognize those rights, we don't, we don't recognize the strict observance or the Asiatic Brethren or the, or the Egyptian right of Freemasonry, but they would have claimed and did claim to be Masonic and in some sense were, were recognized on the continent as being Masonic because all of these rights were with some degree in communication. So. That was my next question is if you had Freemasons that had become members of some of these orders or if they had some of the similar requirements to become a Freemason like we would have known at that time which would have been a man of a certain age obviously being a man well recommended uh, the other question is is that you know did they build their degree structure past the known degrees at that time for Blue Lodge two things so the the Egyptian right actually did initiate women as well uh, so it was a co-Masonic order but um, yes, I mean, they all, they were basically, in a sense, uh, all conferring higher degrees. So, so that was the point. Although, the, you know, some of them, of course, were conferring their own, um, their own versions of the craft degrees as well. So the Egyptian right had its own uh, apprentice, fellow craft and uh, master mason degrees, but they don't, they don't look very much like the craft degrees as we would uh, recognize them. What's interesting is a lot of the brothers I hear that speak of fringe Freemasonry or these other groups, and sometimes they'll use the word occult um, or additional orders or outside orders of Freemasonry, which obviously what was happening at that time was there was a lot of esoteric thought that was just exploding throughout the world uh, as, as the age of reason was well in effect and the age of enlightenment was well in effect. Um, and I feel that today we are having something similar where you have a lot of modern Masons who are trying to find the deeper meanings or additional meanings of our ritual. Uh, they'll jokingly sometimes refer to themselves as Dan Brown Masons. They come in through the symbols and, and that. Um, do you feel that these orders of the past are, are similar in the orders of today where there's almost a letdown um, when they find that they can't make those connections or that their themes are kind of taken over by pop culture? This may be an unpopular opinion, but I don't regard Freemasonry as being a product of the age of reason. I think it's actually a, a reaction against it largely. And, um, you know, I know we love to say that we were de democratic because we have voting in the large, but, um, but but really when you look at Freemasonry and in particular, when you look at the higher rights of Freemasonry, um, they're, they're much more focused on mysteries, um, Christian chivalry, uh, ancient symbols. Uh, and this was everything that the Age of Reason was against. It was against uh, religion, particularly Christianity. Uh, it was against mysteries. Uh, I didn't believe that, that mystery was of any relevance whatsoever and, and didn't have any interest in symbols. It believed in reason and science, uh, and that was it. And believed that man could come to all solutions by thinking. So it didn't believe in deity either. So in effect, you know, why is, why is Freemasonry and why is fringe masonry so popular during the 18th century is because when you strip meaning out of a society by saying that the human brain can know everything and find every solution uh, of course there's going to be a reaction against that and that i would suggest is what freemasonry was to a very large extent um, but in regard to uh, the the uh, these different rights, whether the Asiatic Brethren or the strict observance or the Scottish right. Um, so I don't know if people are disappointed. I'm sure that some brothers are and some are not. But um, 
Uh, I think you know it depends what you're what you're looking for. Um, obviously, it, it was a very different spirit during that time. I think the, the 18th century in Western Europe was much more creative, uh, and these rites were sort of forming and then disappearing, and, and they were taking different elements from from one order or one rite and then incorporating it into another. So pretty much every fringe Masonic rite. Has had has uh, has conferred the rose croix degree at some point, or or a version of the rose croix degree, and even the Knights Templar encampments conferred um, the rose croix degree at one point. So, uh, so you can see this sort of borrowing from each other, influencing each other. Um, uh, I mean, how consistent they are is another matter. But you know, if if you were interested in Kabbalah during the 18th century, when that, when that was a very a very obscure subject, then you you know, you might have done well by joining the Asiatic Brethren, but uh, but um, you know, if if people are disappointed by joining anything that they've joined, then probably they were expecting to have everything handed to them, whereas uh, actually you need to do the work yourself. And you know, I've heard people say, "Oh, I you know, I I joined the Freemasons and I didn't find anything." Uh, anything esoteric there and so well maybe you should have done a bit more research then or maybe maybe if you're so if you're so knowledgeable on the subject maybe you should have given talks that's what I did and that's why I came in contact with all lots and lots of Freemasons who were interested in in that world and in interested in esotericism and beyond that so you know if you if you if you just Want to be a joiner and just turn up and expect to be uh, have things handed to you. I don't. I don't know anywhere else where that works. I mean, you can't join a Zen Buddhist, um, you know, temple and, and think you're going to be enlightened if you turn up and somebody's going to just give you the secrets, you know, or, or you know, or a church or a, or a mosque or a synagogue or even those, you know, and that's the exoteric. So, so you know, it's a problem with. With people's attitudes, actually, you know, as flawed as many of these rights may be, you know, but if you're disappointed, I would look first at yourself and then everybody else after that. <laughs> I think of the conversations that you and I have had where I've gotten excited over finding little differences in ritual from the jurisdiction. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. What's well, the difference between an oblong and a square, right. for example? Yeah. And, you know, these can be really deep conversations. So yeah. I, I share the same thought with you when it comes to. Anybody who says, well, I, I can't find anything in our rituals, like, did you read it? <laughs> Do you know it? Yeah, and I think, you know, it's particularly egregious with Freemasonry because it's the only esoteric um, fraternity or order, or whatever you might want to call it, that goes way back into the medieval period. So if you can't find something in the history and text of Freemasonry over, you know, a 600-year period, well, sorry. No. <laughs> right. Well, let's get to one of the topics that you've mentioned in previous podcasts because they become sure. part of a fringe uh, Freemason group. And that's the Magical Society or the Golden Dawn. Right, right. Certainly Freemason influenced the Golden Dawn. You know, I mentioned the Asiatic Brethren uh, and Jedediah French has written an article on the Asi Asiatic Brethren for the uh, February issue of the Fraternal Review, incidentally. But, uh, you know, he mentions in there that uh, the Asiatic Brethren were influenced by the Golden Rosy Cross, which was a, uh, from the title you might gather, a Rosicrucian society of the 18th century. It only initiated Freemason, so every member was a Freemason. And um, you had to be a master mason. And I think, in fact, you actually had to take the fourth degree or the Scottish master degree at the time. And uh, the Golden Rosy Cross uh, claimed to practice alchemy, uh, claimed to possess the elixir of life, and it claimed to be able to uh, conjure up spirits through the aid of a ghost raising machine. No, again, it wasn't Masonic per se, it was a Rosicrucian alchemical. Um, Sort of magical society, but you had to be a Freemason to join. So in the sense, it, again, it is a fringe Masonic society. Uh, the the uh, Golden Rosy Cross had died out by the end of the 18th century. However, um, it had nine degrees. Uh, you were mentioning the higher degrees. And um, it, during the late uh, 19th century, so a, a century later, um, 
uh, when the Societas Rosicruciana was being uh, formed. Uh, there was a Societas Rosicruciana in Scotland originally, uh, and then it was chartered and uh, taken to England. Originally, it wasn't a Masonic society in Scotland, but in England, it was turned into a purely Masonic society. Uh, the Scottish uh, branch followed suit. And um, the the degree structure was uh, taken from the Golden Rosy Cross. So they, they had nine degrees. So then the the Societas Rosicruciana, which is again, it's a, a only uh, open to Freemasons. So they have nine degrees. And uh, and then two very prominent members of the Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia or in England. Um, uh, William Wynne Westcott and S. R. McGregor Mathers, uh, when they formed the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, they took that same ritual structure uh, and made it the structure for the uh, Golden Dawn with a, a couple of additional degrees. And um, you you can see as well that the 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 subjects that are the interesting to the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and the rituals they're conferring are informed by subjects that, that were studied by the Societas Rosa Christiana and that is in its ritual and it goes back to the Golden Rosy Cross and. Um, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn differs from the Societas Rosa Christiana in that. Um, the the Societas Rosa Cruciana is a essentially a study group where they would study um, study the the doctrines of Kabbalah or study the doctrines of alchemy or Rosicrucianism. Where whereas the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, like the Golden Rosy Cross of the 18th century, are trying to put these things into practice. So they're trying to apply alchemical. Um, uh, theories to ritual there they have rituals that are using the symbols of the the uh, the rosicrucians the rosy cross um and so on so they're trying to be practical they're, they're trying to do rituals to um to create to create change not to uh to study uh them philosophically or historically and um you mentioned the occult so i would uh, so, so my definition of the occult, really, or at least um, how I would differentiate the occult from, from Freemasonry, or let's say the Societas Rosicruciana from the Golden Dawn, is that the, the Golden Dawn is a cult because it, its rituals are meant to transform the individual in some way, whereas the rituals of the Societas Rosicruciana are meant to inform the, uh, the individual. They're not meant to literally transform him. Listening to you talk, I can tell that this February issue of the Fraternal Review is going to be one that men hold on to for years. This this is going to be jam-packed. And, and just knowing yeah, your, so. your research and writing style, that it's going to be something that they enjoy. So I appreciate you as the uh, interim editor-in-chief of uh, the Fraternal Review taking time to, to share this with us. I'd like to talk a little bit more about that opportunity for you and how it opened up. And sure, sure. Um, I've, you know, like I'm sure many brothers have have sought an interest in the Fraternal Review. They have a great podcast that I've listened to. Yeah, uh, yeah. Of course, their publication is well known. Um, yeah. But for those that are listening that are like, what is this? Tell us about the California Lodge of Research. Yeah. So they put out the Fraternal Review, and which is a um, it's a full color print magazine, although you can get um, a, a digital version as well, or instead of, uh, and it comes out, I believe it's 12 times a year, uh, every month. And, um, and, and one of the, the interesting things about it for me is that um, it's, not, it's not as heavy on the historical research, um, at least it's, it's, not, it's not an academic uh, journal. Uh, it, it's really, I would say it's a journal of ideas. Uh, so they will focus on lots of different uh, areas that other Masonic research societies will not focus on. So, for example, uh, in the past, I did one on Freemasonry and style. You, you could even say a Masonic fashion issue. Um, yeah, 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 for sure. And um, there, there was some history in there and uh, some other things. Uh, they also uh, started tackling some modern themes as well. Like, yeah. uh, I, I would call it the craft in the cinema. They did one on Fight Club and Freemasonry and the the Matrix. And Yeah, that's right. And they've done uh, two on Star Wars as well. And 
And this year, there's going to be an issue on uh, Freemasonry and tattooing as well. So, so they try to push the envelope. And there will be other things, uh, uh, other issues this year, one on hermeticism, uh, another on, uh, on uh, Moby Dick, another on the festive board. So things that are maybe a little more uh, mainstream, but, um, but yeah, they were always trying to kind of push the envelope a little bit and, and being a little more creative with uh, the uh, subjects that they tackle. So it, it kind of thinks outside the box, which I, which I appreciate. And this isn't a group where they're like, hey, we're just going to do something. They, they have a strategy that's in place. They are a very well-oiled yeah, machine. Yeah. So as the interim yeah. editor-in-chief, what will your mm-hmm. role be when it comes to either the content or the curation of the articles? So I work with the guest editor. So there's a different theme each month. Um, so the, the February issue, as I mentioned, is the... Uh, is fringe masonry. So I acted actually it's both the guest editor and the interim editor in chief. So I, I would normally I would be working with uh, one of the guest editors who will be putting the issue together with uh, different uh, writers, and then I'll be able to, you know, give give some advice about uh, how uh, articles could be improved or what might be missing, uh, just general things like that to make make sure that there's real value for the reader. And are, are there any topics or issues that will be coming up that you're looking forward to because maybe you had a hand in selecting the theme or you're just excited to write about it? Yeah, so I, I think probably I'm particularly ex- excited about the, the Freemasonry and tattoos issues. I think that that's something that's not been touched on before. So hopefully we'll be able to find some uh, good things for that. <laughs> I could point you to a couple of brothers here in New York State. We did a, a segment called Masonic Inc. on that. I'm happy to share that title even with you sure, sure. but uh it, it is an interesting thing that's happening and kind of to bring it back to the fringe freemasonry is that our craft is always evolving brothers are either looking for yeah. additional insight or just new ways of expressing it and i look at you know masonic tattoos and when you look at some of these it, it's real works of art that people have on them with the rest of their life. And they've chosen to use this form of expression versus a ring or another piece of jewelry. Yeah. And one one of the things that I like about, um, about the fraternal review and that I also admire about these sort of fringe Masonic 18th century groups. Uh, and you had them in the 19th century as well, I should be said. But what, one thing I kind of admire is that, it's a very, very vibrant and there's a lot of creativity and, um, you know, uh, there's, there's a danger in Freemasonry that it's all going to become uh, historically focused. And, you know, it, it's it's good to know the history. You should know the history of Freemasonry, but I wouldn't want it to turn into a club for amateur historians. Uh, Freemasonry should be a living fraternity and that's a creative and vibrant and doing new things. And thinking outside the box. And I think that, you know, that's something that the Fraternal Review is doing. And that you're doing as well. Well, thank you. I've been very impressed uh, watching from afar here in New York State. And now I feel like I have a closer connection to my home state, California, uh, with you taking on this post. And I realize, you know, this year, I think when anyone says, hey, Brother Angel, how are you doing? When you say busy, it's not just, you know, the usual thing most of us say. Uh, You will be quite busy with this post. But The last time we spoke, you were also finishing up uh, your latest successful book. Um, are you still having plans to write another book this year? Yeah, I mean, I'm working on a few different things, actually. Um, wh- one of which is... The reality show. Is that what's next? <laughs> uh, maybe that would be good, but that's not something I've considered before. No, I mean, I'm working on a few, a few different books, and I tend to work on about three at a time, because uh, I'm not quite sure which is going to take off first. Uh, one of them is going to be more on sort of meditation or techniques and inner alchemy, self-development. Another one is, uh, it's a prose poem on initiation, but with a, a lot of e- essays on different aspects of uh, of esotericism. And uh, another one will be on America. I think, that will, I think that'll be some way down the road, though, the American one. And obviously I'm going to be doing a little bit of writing about Freemasonry as well, so. This has been the Craftsman Online Podcast. Again, thanks to our guest this week, Brother Angel Millar, a member of Compact Lodge in New York City, and also now the interim editor-in-chief of the Fraternal Review. If Masonic education is important to you, you can sign up for our email newsletter and stay in touch at craftsmanonline.com. A reminder that new episodes of our podcast are available for download every Monday morning. Until next time, let peace and harmony prevail. Music.